It's not calling you Josh Frydenberg, it's calling you Dosh Frydenberg. Under the coalition, taxes for hard-working Australians will always be lower. You know, I, I don't hold a hose, mate, and I, I don't sit in control room. They're answers that only can come from Victoria, I'm afraid, because that's not my job. But I ain't spending any time, though, because in the meantime, every three months, a person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. Well, good day, listeners, and welcome to the Two Jacks, where we discuss all matters global and local in politics and media. Uh, and joining me, as usual, is Hong Kong Jack. G'day, mate. How are you? Good, good, good. It's uh, how are things in Hong Kong today? It's sticking hot, and um, uh, and half the city seems to be away on holidays. Uh, we call this August. What's the story there? What's going on there? Uh, well, there's still a lot of people who go away for school holidays so um, uh, or, or go back home. A lot of expats go back home. Um, it was once upon a time where this was part of packages, but that's no longer the case. All right. Um, look, uh, there's been a bit of uh, hand-wringing about uh, both political parties. We're going to start with the Libs. Jack, and uh, there's been, oh, I think Peter Van Onselen was talking, oh, well, was writing over the uh, over the weekend in Australia on the direction for the Liberal Party, and he quotes John Howard as saying that people should stop pretending as though the Liberal Party has an existential crisis every time it loses an election, noting the party he once led needs to present itself as, and we've heard this before, a broad church if it wants to be successful. Um, what does that mean for the Liberal Party as it stands today, Jack, with most of its moderate wing gutted by the rise of the Teals in the uh, 2022 election? Well, it just means that you've got to get back to doing the, the basics of the Liberal Party. Um, uh, John Howard's right. Every political party says they want to be a broad church. Um, uh, well, apart from the Greens and uh, anyone on, on, the, on the other on the other end of the spectrum, uh, who want to appeal to niche, but the two major parties want to be a broad church. They want to appeal to a, a range of people. They want to have a range of views within that party, um, so they can attract something like, you know, thirty or forty or fifty percent of um, uh, of the vote. Well, not going to get fifty, mate. Not in this day and age. You're flat out getting thirty at the moment in polling. Um, uh, so, uh, where does this leave a, a leader uh, like Peter Dutton from the right-wing faction of the party and an LMP Queenslander at that? Um, well, uh, Peter Van Onselen uh, was was more astute than I'm used to reading uh, from him. Um, he said that, you know, uh, as, a, as a member of the right in the party, Dutton has the opportunity to if you like, do a Nixon. You know, Nixon was the person who could open up to China because he belonged to the, you know, um, that side of politics. The, the I doubt very politics. much that we'll see Peter Dutton opening up to China. No, Jack, but, you reckon but, we were at war last Anzac Day or Anzac Day 2022? But he Prepare has the, for war. He has the opportunity to um, to. Uh, he has the authority and the opportunity, and, and Van Onselen's right about this, to uh, broaden the party back to include some more moderates, some more Christopher Pine types, if you like. I find it pretty strange that John Howard would be talking about broad churches and what have you, when basically he gutted the moderates out of the party in the uh, in the 80s, Jack. Uh, people like Fred Cheney were uh, given short shrift um, and, of course, this time we've got a very similar situation, although those sort of moderates have largely been excised from the party by the election, um, and, uh, and it leaves the right ascendant. Um, and, of course, we do have uh, the Liberal Party's opposition to the voice, which seems to be, certainly to me, little more than a divisive tactic to uh, embrace its conservative um, uh, conservative voters and followers. Um, well, I don't think the opposition to the voice. Firstly, I don't think it's going to make any difference to the vote. I think the vote's going to lose for reasons unrelated to party politics. Um, uh, and secondly, um, uh, that's not going to harm them because they're going to find themselves on the side of the majority. 
Well, the the conservative view at this stage is if the voice gets knocked over uh, in referendum, and you say it will, and it, certainly the polling would indicate that that's the case, that really it's the Liberals' best chance of victory at the next federal election. Yeah, I don't, don't agree with that either. I, I don't think it's a huge electoral plus for them, um, but nor is it a minus. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. Um, uh, but they will feel... Um, uh, they will feel a, a little bit fired up if they do get the result they are looking for. And when we say they, there are a number of members of the Liberal Party who actually, including the um, uh, Julian Lisa, the former um, uh, Indigenous Affairs spokesperson, um, uh, who are supporting the voice, but um, but the Liberal Party itself and the National Party, of course, uh, are not. And they will stay. They they are certain to take a fair amount of. Uh, uh, take a fair amount of glee, I suppose, out of this because they were looking very, very shabby post-election. Well, well, there's always a a little boost to morale um, if you find yourself on the winning side rather than the losing side for a change. Yeah. So yeah, that, that right. doesn't take you very far, but it's a nice little sugar hit um, to rally the troops. It's like having a win in question time, you know. Um, uh, it's very Not much good more for than the that, you reckon. Troops. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, um, look, I just want to break away uh, just uh, from our uh, from our notes and just ask you what does what does the Liberal Party do with Scott Morrison? Um, what do they do with him? Um, they hope that he finds something else to do and gets out of Parliament and moves on. He's just he seems to be struggling to find something else to do that will give him the sort of coin that he would like, Jack. Um, yes, I suspect that's right. Um, uh, if you kind of trash your own reputation, um, that will happen to you. <clears throat> um, is it is it a, a, a possible um, uh, a, a offensive sort of attack style thing from Labor to say, "Well, look, you've learned nothing. There's your there's your man right there, sitting on the back bench, doing nothing, uh, earning his." Uh, or well, not earning, but getting, receiving his uh, his MP salary uh, because he got nothing else, and there he is sitting there. Or, or indeed, I guess Labor could say, "Well, he, he you know, will Peter Dutton consider him for the ministry in a in a in a coalition elected government?" Yeah, it's not a, bad line, not a bad line him. of attack, but I don't think it goes very far. <laughs> but you know. It's, it does beg a belief, though, and I suppose it sort of raises the sort of issues about what do we do with some of these ex PMs now that the super, the big parliamentary super is, is is well, it's been off the table since two thousand and four, and you've seen people come into the system into into parliament um, who are receiving their their uh, standard. Um, uh, Standard superannuation and not much more, unless they want to contribute more, that is. And I dare say that uh, Scott Morrison's on a fairly decent wicket, so I'm not entirely sure what's going on. It's, in, it, it's entirely possible, as I say, Jack, that uh, Scott's not very good with money. Um, but um, uh, we are finding this issue going forward. It, it, it seems to me the only reason Scott Morrison is still in Parliament is because he's on a $200,000 plus salary a year and perks, and, um, and, and he cannot earn that anywhere else. So well, what do the, we do? The decision to change the um, uh, pension arrangements for MPs and, and, um, and Parliament, I mean, MPs and, and ministers and prime ministers, was a Mark Latham idea and about as good as every other Mark Latham idea at Stank. <laughs> well, it was a Mark Latham, I mean, Mark Latham idea, embraced in panic by John Howard at yes. the time yes. because yes. it did look like Mark Latham was going to win the next election. Whew. Thank God that never happened, Jack. Yes, we Can dodged imagine one we'd we, still be putting the fire out? We dodged one there, didn't we? Um, the... Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, look, it, it was it was a silly idea. Uh, it means you get yeah. situations like the Scott Morrison situation where it's very hard for them to move on in the absence of anything else they can do. Um, yeah. uh, we ought to. It doesn't cost us all that much in the scheme of a federal budget to look after former MPs and and former ministers and prime ministers um, uh, in the way we used to. Well, 
let me go further and say this is sort of an encouragement for people who enter politics, isn't it? Because if you're going to basically stop your career and go into politics, go into parliament and then come out of it um, with uh, no particular financial advantage besides what is a, a reasonable wicket, to be on, but in corporate terms, pretty ordinary. Uh, and I'd suggest that we're not getting the very best of our people. I'd go a little bit further than that, Jack, that these sort of obsessions about um, uh, parliamentary expenses and the occasional rort uh, are the sorts of things that keep good people out of our parliaments. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that you could be on the front page of the newspaper being, in, you know, implied that you're being a crook because you've uh, uh, you've uh, offered a couple of grand on uh, on expenses that you shouldn't have is the sort of thing that, that keeps good people out of politics. Indeed. Or well, because your son's been given a chairman's lounge membership in the case of Anthony Albanese. Yeah, it's just nonsense stuff, isn't it? You know, and and when you take that down to state politics in particular, who do have reasonable, I think across the board, certainly New South Wales and Victoria do have reasonable parliamentary superannuation schemes, um, and probably a lot more, um, uh, it's certainly a, a, a lot more uh, generous than they were in in the pre two thousand and four days in the federal sphere. Um, uh, <coughs> that you you really are, you know, you, you you're sort of tilting as. Keating said with, you know, sort of low altitude flyers, low calibre people, um, because uh, a lot of people who should or could get into public, a business of public administration through the parliaments, um, are sort of deterred from doing so by the prospect of a, of a dismal scandal over a thousand bucks or so. The other risk, of course, is that if parliamentarians can't do their job and not have to worry too much about the future, then they will start worrying about their financial future while they're parliamentarians or ministers or prime ministers. And then you go down the American line where they're not paid enough, but they all get rich while they're there. Um, yeah. In fairly dubious circumstances. And we don't want that. We've always paid our parliamentarians well. We've always looked after former prime ministers well, and we should go back to that. All right. I think that's a reasonable comment, Jack. Meanwhile, Jack, the Labor Party, the, um, uh, well, news in the Australia today, we'll get to the National Conference shortly, but um, there's been a bit of branch stacking in Victoria, Jack. Oh, heaven forbid it. Who'd have thought, for thought that could happen? You know? A couple of, couple of dead people <laughs> paid their membership uh, in uh, the branch associated with the Climate Action, Energy and Resources Min Minister, Lily D'Ambrosio. Um, the, the two dead people were... Um, were uh, both members, uh, substantial members of the Italian Australian community, uh, and uh, long after their deaths, uh, their memberships were paid for. That's in dedication cash. to the cause, isn't it? In cash, by the way. Hard to see how that transaction actually occurs. Uh, Daniel Andrews is dismissing it all, of course, and you've got both sides have been branch stacking. You know, at uh, what's the what's the almost cliche now at industrial scale uh, for a very long period of time. It, it's certainly a very ugly business in, in in these things. To explain how they might work, Jack, it's it's basically getting membership not for your party necessarily, but for your faction, so that you can keep. Um, and you can keep the branches at bay and they'll continue to pre-select you as their preferred candidate. That's that's how it works, isn't it, Jack? Uh, pretty much. Um, it was rife in the uh, – when I was heavily involved in the Labor Party in the 70s and 80s, it was rife particularly in the um, ethnic groups. People were very keen to set up a Greek branch in Brunswick and all that sort of stuff, you know, and, and you would find – you would talk to some of the Greek members of the Labor Party who were astonished that they were, in fact, members of the Labor Party. Uh, <coughs> yes, indeed. So um, <coughs> uh, on the other side of uh, politics, Jack, the Liberal Party has branch stacked to, uh, to such a degree now that the state executive or the state council, I should say, I think it's around about 200 member state council and of them I think some 30 people are Mormons, Jack. It's hardly representative of the community or indeed their constituencies. Yeah, but it's been going on forever and it's not peculiar to Australia. I had this conversation with a friend from um, the south side of Chicago 
um, and we were comparing notes on how the Democrat Party machine operated in the south side of Chicago with how the Labor Party operated in the inner suburbs of Melbourne, and they just about lined up on everything. <laughs> um, uh, it's just what, what happens when you get a party machine, particularly when that party machine controls the instruments of local government and can hand out jobs. Indeed. All right. So National National Conference, Labor Party's National Conference, highly orchestrated, choreographed events these days, Jack. Uh, uh, are we to, going back to the Terrigal days? That was my well, favourite yeah, we'll get we'll get to that at the moment because in the old days there used to be a bit of argy-bargy, Jack, uh, a bit of factional infighting, um, or party infighting uh, driven by the factions. Um, but these days, and for a long time since, or for a long time uh, uh, in the recent past, it's uh, um, uh, it's been uh, uh, highly choreographed, highly organised things. But take us back to a little bit of history, Jack. In, uh, in uh, well, Terrigal in February 1975 on the central coast of New South Wales was... Um, Absolutely a highlight of conference history. Um, uh, it was um, hot and sunny, um, and they were at the cut thing of the name of the hotel now. Um, oh, there's uh, really only the, one in, uh, yeah, in Terrigal, so yeah, that must it, be it. it. It's the big hotel right on the waterfront there. With, uh, the building sort of swings around a pool, central yeah. pool area, and all that sort of stuff. So the papers were full for days of Hawkey sitting there with the shirt off in the budgie smugglers, um, uh, having a beer. Um, uh, surrounded by bevies of young <coughs> female staffers. Um, uh, and uh, it was quite a – right in the middle of the Judy Morosi, um, uh, Jim Cairns um, uh, breakout. So they were giving separate little press conferences each as well. So yeah, it, sure, was, no, it, fair. it was just – you know, you just kind of knew from then on that the Labor government was in a fair bit of trouble, and they were gone by November. So, um, uh, so that's that's sort of how it went. Like gone by December. Um, a lot of them were in Hobart for many many years. Yeah, they were in Hobart for a reason. Um, uh, they found that they could get a good deal on the Rest Point Casino, um, and it was. Um, and they were beset in those days by anti-uranium protesters in particular um, who would um, uh, sit out the front of the conference and harangue people. And if you were in Brisbane, that was sort of a comfy thing to do. But they figured if they held them in Hobart in July, um, that quiet. would be very cold uh, and quite wet yeah. and, and no one's going to want to travel down to Hobart um, uh, and, and protest. And that was very successful. And the conference just um, became a little bit better organised, um, in fact, quite well organised. Um, there were still plenty of debates, uh, but the actual end result tended to be massaged so that the government, you know, the, the, the government could win. Debate's a good thing, though, Jack, in a political party, and it should be encouraged. Yep. And yep. here we have a sort of... Um, uh, a, a situation that requires a bit of balance because if you're going to have these highly choreographed displays of unity, it means you're not having those conversations, those important arguments. Yes, there should be argy bargy. Yes, there should be. I mean, they, these things, of course, the Labor Party and to a degree the Liberal Party hold their their uh, various conferences in public, in the public domain. Unlike the uh, Greens. Unlike filmed. the Greens where it's... Unlike uh, the Greens. Where it's done, done with the secrecy of the Soviet. <clears throat> it is indeed. It is indeed. And it is something that the Greens, and I know there are people within the Greens who, who, who want it to be different, but there's there's some really, you know, stories that we can't check about Argy Bargy and people getting stomped on uh, at, at a Green State Conference, for example, because the media is prohibited from entering. Um uh, so they're not really <laughs> they're showing their colours there, aren't they? Um, but uh, when we get to the, the, the Labor Party and indeed the Liberals and any party, you should be having a bit of argy-bargy. You should My be word. having um, a, a good debates on policy to get to that because what the National Conference does, Jack, at least in a um, sort of black letter way, technically, is that it proposes policy for the for the parliamentary wing, in this stage, the, the Albanese government, to implement. It is. Look, it's better to hammer these issues out um, uh, on the floor of the uh, the conference. Uh, for starters, going through that debate um, fits the party up better to argue their case when they go to the public. The public, by and large, ignore conferences. 
Um, uh, so you can, it doesn't matter if you have a bit of argy bargy there, but yeah. having the debate means you refine the arguments in, in, in a much better way, in a much stronger way. So when you have, to, when you're trying to sell those to the public, you're in a better, better situation to do so. And Sean Kelly, a former uh, staffer in the uh, Gillard and Rudd uh, years as an advisor, uh, been writing in Nine Media, Jack, he said, uh, this, uh, <coughs> these choreographed shows don't really work. The purpose of a national conference, he, wrote, he writes, the movement votes on policy and that is what Labor MPs then work to deliver. If Labor leaders want to change policy, they must convince the movement as John Curtin did on the issue of conscription during World War II. I think there's probably just needed another sentence there, Sean, because, of course, there was no conscription in um, in World War II and Curtin was able to convince the party that that was not the right way to go. Um, so these things are important, Jack. So what are we missing when there's not a great deal of heated debate and argument? Well, it, it just means you end up with a, a weak, either a weaker poly, policy position or a weaker argument to support it. Or a homogenised sort of policy that, yeah. that doesn't that doesn't get thought through um, as well as it possibly could be. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And, that, and one big policy area, of course, and I think this is the big policy for any government in power for the next 20 years or more is housing. I think it's the most critical um, uh, thing because you've got, right now you've got two groups in Australia and the gap is widening by the day. Those who own land and how and, and a home and those who don't. Uh, and and that gap is, is widening, um, as I say, uh, almost on a daily basis because in, in our major cities. And that makes housing policy particularly difficult to deal with because the more what they call affordable housing you put into the system, that necessarily ref- that necessarily will will impact on the price of housing that people have already invested in and have mortgages over. So these things are not as simple as dealing with the supply-demand issues that we have in our major cities, although there is that. A very, very difficult one. We've got the Greens basically rejecting, um, uh, in the Senate, rejecting uh, uh, Labor's uh, $10 billion social housing or housing policy. Um, And... um, uh, it looks like right now that $10 billion is just sitting in the Commonwealth coffers and nothing's been done about it, and we do have this major problem with demand in our major cities. So how do we get around all of this, Jack? What, what, the, the Greens reckon rent control's the issue. Yeah, I don't think the rent control issues work for anybody apart from the people who are lucky enough to get them. Um, they haven't I think it's anywhere. actually a, a very good political tactic, but hollow. Yes. It, it doesn't have any chance of success. I've seen Maureen Faruqi, Senator Maureen Faruqi, talking about um, how easy it would be to do uh, that uh, uh, Albanese and the state and territory ministers, uh, uh, state and territory premiers and, and chief ministers would, would simply just have to uh, uh, shake hands on it and that was it, done deal. It would require legislation to go through all levels of all state and federal levels of parliament. And meanwhile, Jack, while uh, the Greens' call for rent control is coming, um, there are reports, early days, of course, that the rental crisis is coming off the boil. Yeah. um, The the only place that has rental controls in in the country is the local government in Canberra. Um, Yeah. There are particular problems there, aren't there, in Canberra, because you've got, you know, you've got, housing for the bureaucracy um, you've got housing for the you need housing for the fly in fly outers um, and then you've got the people who actually live there yeah and it's um it has a, a peculiar demographic in that um, because there are so many public servants there there's so many people in the same range of income right yeah it's, right. it's, a, it's a more compressed a demographic, if you like. When you have a look at the ACT unemployment figures, you get a better a better idea of that. There's virtually zero unemployment. Yeah. The ACT really 
it gets um, any worse. So, so that's different. But you do have vested interest. I mean, you, there's the vested interest of those who've already got a property and they don't want to see the value of that property diminish. Then you've got the vested interest of the people who want to buy one. So they want the property prices to come down. So you've got compete, and these are difficult things to manage politically. You've got varying interests. But, uh, but see, I do think one of the big problems in, in, in Australia is we've got way too much planning control and red tape to that prevent That is development. an issue. Might I, might I propose not a solution but a way forward, Jack, and that would be a housing summit. I know people might think that this is just a bit of a, a, bit of a circus, um, but actually get everyone in the same room. That's local government, state government, federal government. Uh, you get developers in the room. You get people, uh, um, uh, rental advocates. You get everyone in the same room and you, you, <laughs> you close the door, lock the doors and say, don't come out until you've got a bloody solution. Well, that's, that's um, why the Hawk Summit worked, is you got those various vested interests in the same room, and they had to argue their corner, but they also had to acknowledge that somebody else had a point as well. Yeah, exactly right. So, it, you know, it's politics. It's about compromise. Yes. It's about thrashing out, thrashing out things and, and, and coming up with solutions. So I, because I think this is such an important thing, uh, politically, for any party going forward, you really do have two groups of Australia: those who those who own uh, property and those who don't. Yeah. And those who don't are finding it almost impossible to get into the market unless they move to the regions or to the outer suburbs. Um, and we're not, you know, and in Sydney, we're talking about sixty k out. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very, very difficult situation. I, I believe there's, you know, it's particularly poisonous for, for governments who get, get things wrong. Uh, and I think this was a major sort of influence on the demographics that we see around those who support the coalition. They're now getting into, now getting into that sort of 40 years of age sort of group. Um, <clears throat> And, um, and, and, and those people are, are looking around, they're paying rent, uh, they're, they're finding it uh, impossible to, to buy where they would like to buy, and that's not a selfish thing. I mean, we're not talking about they want to buy waterfront property in the eastern suburb. Um, and, and they are feeling very disgruntled, and I think they will judge political parties, governments, harshly if they don't get these things right. Yeah. But as I say, I think part of the problem is we've made it too easy for uh, planning authorities and local government um, uh, and, and, and ratepayers to slow down or stop development. Yeah, I did see one of the SBS. SBS have one of those studio shows, a bit like yeah. Q&A, where they encourage people from the audience to talk about it. Uh, it's occasionally amusing, and I look at it from time to time. But there, there was one on, on this housing. Is the, there. The, this is the one that's headed by the ex ABC woman. Um, yes, yes, there, there, that's right. And, yeah, she's, um, she's quite good. Yeah, look, you know, it's 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 pretty pretty difficult sort of thing to do, but she seems to be able to moderate fairly well. Um, but there, there, they had a couple who had lived in the uh, well, the west of Sydney. And they were saying we want to we want to live we want to continue to live on a quarter acre block, and we don't want changes in planning to uh, to allow dual occupancies or you know uh, the, the the place next door to be uh, transcended into uh, into units that uh, that ultimately house twenty or thirty people, uh, and but that's kind of the way we have to go in our in our inner cities, uh, even going out to probably a radius of around 10 or 20 kilometres, whether it be at Melbourne or Sydney, you can't have a quarter acre. I mean, it's already happening, to, but, but too slowly. I mean, a place, too like, slow, yeah. a place yeah. like Chatswood is, a, is going to be a mini city around a transport hub, and that's what you have to do. Okay. Outgoing Reserve Bank Governor Phil, Philip Lowe said in his final appearance before the House of Representatives Economics Committee, um, uh, I think this was uh, a couple of days ago, um, uh, it said he, he reckons the, the solution to incre- is to increase housing supply. It's not quite as simple as that, though, Jack, is it? Uh, no, it's not, but he's making a very good point. I think your idea about the summit's correct. Um, uh, my favourite contribution was from the member for Wentworth, um, my local member, if, if I was on, I'm still on the roll, Allegra Spender. Um, the PM must show he's serious about getting zoning reform from the states so we can start to find a way out of the housing nightmare. Um, 
uh, given that her electorate covers places such as Vaucluse, Willara, uh, Double Bay. Uh, <laughs> Where people do have a bit of land. Well, yeah. not everyone. I mean, there's a lot of – there is some medium density yeah, yeah, uh, housing yeah, but, going on there. But uh, good, luck, good luck with trying to encourage the, the local residents in Wentworth to knock over their places and whack up a tower. Knock, knock on Malcolm Turnbull's uh, uh, door and say, look, I was just wondering if you could give us your pool. We want to knock up some flats there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but look, that, that, that's, that's a solution. Listen to me, Elbow. Listen to me. I don't know who the housing minister is. I just can't remember her name. But but uh, we need to – you basically need to put all stakeholders in a room and try and get this sorted because um, you really are going to uh, hit some political hardship if you don't deal with it. Now, I don't see the coalition has any answers at the moment either. So if you can solve it or at least solve it to a point of satisfaction to the majority of people, you'll have done very, very well. Uh, it, it, there is a cost for not solving it, but there's a huge benefit if you can make it better. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What about Labor and the regions, Jack? Well, I think this was a, um, a, a really good sign from Labor, and we're talking about Labor's need to be a broad church as well. But Madeline King, who's the Resources Minister, is she, I think? Yes, she uh, is. Um, uh, she was talking about the need to support what happens in the region, including mining and, you know, resource uh, extraction, all that sort of stuff, you know. Um, uh, and Labor needs to win that, um, uh, win that demographic back. I, I, I was talking to a few people in the bush you know, a month or so ago uh, and I, I came across one bloke and he's been a, a farmer for a very, very long time and he said, I've never never voted for the National Party once in my life. And that probably tells me he's voted for a Liberal candidate where one's been available or chosen an independent. I doubt that. Oh, there might have been occasions when he voted Labor. but And there are a large group of people like that. I mean, when we talk about the rorts, and we're going to talk about a few of them uh, a little bit later in the show, the National Party wrote the book on on rorts, and and that's that's left a lot of people in the regions pretty unhappy with them. Um, their their electoral performances haven't been bad uh, as a junior coalition partner. They've be, they've definitely been better than the Libs, but I, I honestly believe if Labor shows a bit there, a bit of support for the resources, uh, sorry for the for the regions, um, uh, and. Uh, and that means wholehearted support for development of the regions, be it in mining, be it in, um, be it in um, 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 social development, uh, then they can actually pick up a few seats. They could. The difficulty is, can they persuade? Can they? Can the people who are pro this in the Labor Party drag enough of the rest of the party with them to pull it off? But the um, the performance by Madeline King the other day was very promising. All right, uh, over now, of course, to the Sovereign Off Affair, Jack, uh, the Sovereign Off Inquiry, and uh, we're not still not quite sure what to call it as a, as a political or judicial scandal. But uh, Bruce Learman, he was speaking to a Channel 7 Spotlight program. It's Channel 7, that's right. Yeah, it does Spotlight, straight pinch from, uh, from the Boston Globe, of course. Uh, and there he was being interviewed, Jack. Firstly, let me ask you, is he doing a Jack Elliott? Um, I think he'd do better to sit at home on a Sunday night or whenever he does the interviews rather than going out there uh, and, and, and doing this. Uh, it just doesn't seem to be any plus for him. I think he's in a really strong position right now. Um, he says he's after about $6 million, uh, in a suit against the, the ACT government and like I said last week, um, uh, as a, an old litigation lawyer, I'd be very happy to have him in my waiting room uh, come, coming in to see me. He's like he's got a, a very good prospect of getting that, um, provided he plays his cards well enough. Yeah. Look, uh, the, I, I didn't see the interview, but I, I read a transcript of it uh, yesterday. And uh, when he was asked about that period where he le- where he and Higgins were both in the minister's office or in a broad area around the min- around the ministers, and that was the defence minister, Linda Reynolds, uh, he took off and he was asked about that. And 
it just doesn't seem quite credible to me. Um, but anyway, that's, but what, um, that's, okay. that doesn't mean that he's guilty. It just means it's a very strange telling of the story. Can I, can I just comment on that? Um, I don't think, and I've said this all along, I don't find his story about that credible and I don't find hers credible either. Well, they've, um, both, got, they've both got significant gaps. They've got, both got um, holes the, like a Swiss that, cheese. That really do leave people wondering. I mean, if he's, he said that she claimed that she had work to do and that's certainly not her view, but it, they, they've gone up, they've gone through the parliamentary security, they've gone up and... Listeners, just trust me. Where they've where they've got to is about five hundred meters away, and uh, two flights in the uh, in the elevator. Up, she's walked into the she's walked into Reynolds' actual office, opened the door, and then closed it. He's gone to his desk, and then done whatever he needed to do. And that's a little bit vague too. He's missed a couple of calls on his phone from his girlfriend at two o'clock in the morning. He reckons he always has his phone on silent, and then. Just wanders off, just goes out. Yeah. Anyway, um, what, what, one of our listeners has his own theory about this, and, and we, ha- we we must say this is just pure speculation on his part. Uh, but he says, look, you know, just look at them when they, as they walk in the door, getting on very well. They're in the minister's office on the couch, bit of fumbling about. The phone pings. It's the girlfriend giving him the uh, "you must come home." Um, and he grabs his phone and um, uh, and scoots out the door. Uh, well, we don't want to speculate. I mean, look, it, but, it, this uh, matter will never go to trial believable. again. At least that we'll sounds never, believable. We, we don't want to speculate too much, but that is one gap in the story that Lehman is just doesn't doesn't seem quite right. And as you say, quite rightly, look, sexual assault matters are very very difficult matters where you do have uh, one word against the other. And there will be gaps in both stories. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean guilt or innocence, Jack, guilt or not guilty. Sometimes you have different guilty. recollections of exactly the same event. Um, exactly right. Exactly. <laughs> you see this routinely in criminal trials. Uh, what about Linda Reynolds, Jack? Where she stand now? She'd be standing with her hand out, wouldn't she, at the moment? Um, I guess she is. Uh, she's been vindicated to this, to this extent that the the idea that she covered covered up the sexual assault, I think she's sort of um, um, blown that out of the water. Really, there's just no evidence that she covered up anything at all. Um, uh, but um, I, I think she could learn a bit from Jack Elliott as well and put, <laughs> and put away the defamation rent. <laughs> she seems to be very keen on pursuing it at the moment. She, uh, uh, she, she, she's claimed that she was the perfect villain um, and uh, she said, although none of it, this is the irony of, irony, of, irony of it, none of it was absolutely true. We're talking about uh, what you just mentioned there, that she, she basically sought to cover up. None of it. I just have to simply advise her what, an irony is too, Jack, because that's not an irony. That's not an irony at all. But anyway, um, uh, <coughs> look, it's just going to go back to the courts, and it'll probably be, be endless. And there, you know, the, 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 there will be defamation pursuits. There will be uh, lit- litigation left, right, and centre on this for a very long time to come. The only the only case you'd want to have anything to do with is is Lerman's case against the ACT. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, the voice, Jack, and the campaigning has begun. Certainly from the, uh, well, from both sides, really. But uh, the yes campaign got underway, uh, and uh, the pamphlets are out in the mail. We haven't received ours yet, Jack. Uh, you get both. Um, you get the yes and no. Uh, the AEC said, "Look, we'll send them out," but. Um, uh, but uh, we have no control over the content of them. Uh, and Warren Mundine has seen the Yes pamphlet and he said it's a fantasy novel about a magical wand called The Voice that will solve all problems. Actually, they can only be solved by economic participation, kids in schools, adults in jobs, business creation and home ownership. Jack, I came across a video on Twitter the other day um, where Warren Mundine back in 2017 was calling for a voice and not just a voice, but a voice that could be, that could not be disposed of, uh, by governments, a, a voice that had, 
a a grounding in constitutional law, Jack. He's had a bit of a change of mind. Is that because he wasn't invited to Uluru? That could have been. Um, I saw the same video um, and chuckled to myself. Um, uh, I've got no particular problem with people changing their mind on political issues, um, but he, he, he certainly has. Um, I, I think he made one good point in that, um, uh, in, in his little uh, uh, rant rant about the, the content of the Voice um, uh, pamphlet. Um, I, I'm, I, I think we do need to look at economic participation, home ownership, uh, kids in school, adults and jobs, et cetera, et cetera, if we're going to fix the remote Aboriginal disadvantage. Well, we definitely do, Jack. I think the, I think the point from the yes from the yes group is that let's hear from Indigenous voices on that rather yeah. than impose them from Canberra. Uh, Ross Cameron, meanwhile, has said uh, of the No pamphlet, Dutton's regional voice is a blunder. Too cute by half, muddies his message. Half supports the yes case. Nationals are right. This is not to do with the pamphlet, I must say. Nationals are right to oppose. Dutch would be better to follow Napoleon's advice. Good Lord. Never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. Not Stanley. often I agree with Ross Cameron. He's a very Cameron. strange human being, Ross Cameron. I've yeah, met him yeah. on a number of occasions. Yeah. He's very, quite lovely at, at face value, but a very he's, very strange man, I'd say. He, he, he is good company, but I agree that he's on the stranger end of that, that spectrum. Um, but he's right about this. I, I don't know why Dutton's saying that. Um, I think that the yes case is sinking itself. Um, if Dutton's ambition is to prevent the yes case from winning, um, he could go on holiday and let them do it to themselves. Yeah, and he is having five bob each way on constitutional yeah. recognition, and um, <clears throat> but without the voice. Um, and look, I'll just simply tell you my, my favourite Ross Cameron story, Jack. I've known him for a little while because I used to do a bit of Sky News work and I'd see him around the traps a bit and we'd always have a bit of a chat. And he was His, his quite, father was an MP before him, wasn't he? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah he'd been in politics. I think, was he a state or federal? I can't remember. Uh, the, the state, old man. state first, then federal, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. Anyway, Ross... Uh, so Ross and I uh, met uh, again uh, at, uh, at, a, at actually a book launch uh, for the late uh, a book uh, uh, for the late departed uh, Bill Leake, and Ross came over and we we're having a lovely conversation. Then someone from the Commonwealth Bank, fairly senior executive, walked past and he decided he wanted to go and talk to more interesting people than me and brush me. Anyway, so I, I forgive you, Ross. I forgive you, Ross. I understand. I know. I know what motivates you. Um, anyway, um, yeah, she's... Uh, uh, well, if I, I hadn't known that you were an old pal of Ross Cameron's, but that might explain the strange look I gave him when I introduced myself to him in about 2005. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, see. He's, he's a unit. Um, but And speaking of units, Jack, uh, Mark Latham uh, has been given the push from One Nation. He's been sacked as leader as head of the party in New South Wales, of course, and he's not taking it lying down. But Hanson has jumped in, um, established a New South Wales uh, exec, state executive from people within the Queensland party, and um, and Latham, uh, Latham is essentially, uh, well, he continues to believe that he is a parliamentary leader uh, of, the, of One Nation, but um, he's going to have to walk alone, it looks like it, Jack. Yeah, I was looking at this and thinking, is it a situation where he's too nutty for Pauline Hanson or not or not nutty enough for Pauline Hanson? <laughs> it's, it, it's a it's a it's a real dilemma, that one, a real conundrum. Um look, she's jumped all over him. It did he's being sued, of course, by Alex Green, Greenwich for some really appalling comments that he made on Twitter about him and um and his defense, Jack, his defense on the defo is that uh, he's actually um He's actually, uh, uh, by his comments, has uh, has in, in, in amplified the reputation of Alex Greenwich, which will be an interesting one to see to see how it goes in court. I have a strong feeling that it may not get all that far, but we'll see. Um, and so, what happens now, Jack? I mean, well, let's look at firstly, let's look at why. Pauline might have intervened. I think your theory is a pretty good one. But why would she have intervened? She reckons uh, that the New South Wales performance in the state election, uh, there was a 14% swing against our party from the previous election. 
which was very high and was unusually high in 2019. Uh, and uh, and uh, and then Lathos turned around and said, well, it's not as bad as 2019 where uh, they lost 1% of the overall vote, but the swing against would probably be of the same sort of order, Jack. Yeah, and he had a, he had a swing at her about her performance in, in Queensland as well. Yes. <laughs> Well, it's uh, going to be interesting to see how that goes. Well, look, it, it, he, he's maintaining that he is the, the leader of One Nation in the New South Wales lower, uh, upper house, I should say, uh, where I think they have uh, three members now, don't they? And they have three yeah, or just and, two. And it rather depends upon what the other two do. Cause he's, yeah, because he's pulled a Swifty. Yeah, it, it, that's it, isn't it? They, he pulled a Swifty and, and basically put himself up for re-election and then... Uh, uh, either one of the retiring members was given a saw. He's he 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 retired, didn't he? He basically yeah. retired and then got one of uh, his people put through on the um, pass through without a ballot, and um, and then he uh, won re-election. So there are three of them there now, and it, I guess it does depend on the other two. Yes, um, but this is what happens with minor parties, Jack, isn't it? They fracture it, and they it, splinter it, at any given time. It can happen with the bigger parties, but it, but it, it, very rare, very very rarely. But it often happens with the minor party. Uh, well, Malcolm Roberts is up for re-election. You uh, remember you remember the, the the demise of the Democrats? How messy that got before they disappeared. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Malcolm Roberts is up for re-election in uh, in the next federal election uh, out of the Senate, and uh, it really would be good to see him go. And he is an absolute kook. I mean, just. Conspiracy theories up the wazoo. Um, all right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that, Jack. It's bound to be messy. Hair and teeth and blood all over the walls when it happens. An excellent entertainment. Uh, very, 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 very entertaining. Um, the Lee and Gatha uh, mushroom poisoning. We'll just touch on this very, very briefly. We reported on it last week. Um, the Australian, of course, uh, broke the story um, and much – it really did get into gossip territory with a lot of pretty ordinary reporting, Jack, and a number of the locals running around saying, pay me, pay me and I'll tell you what uh, what I know, um, <laughs> which is a bit dubious. Uh, and then, of course, Erin uh, Patterson came forward uh, yesterday to say that she had made a statement to police after a long interview, a sworn statement, um, her, uh, she clarified that she had previously given the police, I think she was interviewed on Saturday the 4th of August, where she gave essentially a no-comment reply throughout the interview. Um, she uh, mentioned yesterday in that in the body of this sworn statement that she provided to police that she had obtained um, button mushrooms from a local supermarket or a supermarket chain, and uh, it's only really two, so, um, well, maybe three. Um, so uh, she didn't specify who that was. While she had obtained um, other dried mushrooms from an Asian supermarket that she couldn't identify uh, that, but was in Mount Waverley. Um, do you know how many Asian supermarkets there are or Asian markets there are in uh, <laughs> Mount Waverley, Jack? Uh, probably quite a lot these days. I it's checked. Pretty- I checked. Just on a Google search, <coughs> there's, there's 10. So it would be very, very difficult um, uh, to establish uh, whether she, whether what she was saying is accurate or not. Um, uh, we've, we've still got a long way to go on this. And, and the other thing that we learned about this was that, uh, yes, it was a beef wellington uh, and um, – and uh, she had some, and that she fell ill as well, and was treated in hospital. I believe she was treated on the thirty first, and there seems to be an indication. Forgive me if I'm wrong about this. That she went home and then returned to hospital, and then she was ultimately transferred to Monash Medical Centre. Yeah, that's that's, that's uh, my understanding as well. Yeah, and and uh, and that occurred when I say the thirty first. Uh, the other four had been hospitalised on the thirtieth. Um, at, uh, at the local hospital and then they were ultimately transferred and then transferred again to the Alfred where three of the four died. The good news is <coughs> it passed around Wilk- Wilkinson is is, um, is uh, con- uh, believed to be in better shape than he was certainly a week ago on less life support 
uh, than than he was last week, and that raises the prospect of a recovery. And uh, no doubt he'll have something to say about about the events of that uh, particular lunch on the 29th of July. Uh, also, you've got apparently she said uh, that she served uh, she served the lunch and each one took their plates. The two children were not. Her two children, I believe the sort of teenagers, young teenagers, they were not present at the time. They were given the leftovers of the, she says, uh, were given the leftovers of the beef wellington, but they don't like mushrooms, so they were picked out for them. Um, the only other thing of interest, I think, is the dehydrator. Um, and she said she did acknowledge that she lied to police about that. Um uh, she said that uh, she was conversing with her two children at a hospital, presuming this is 30, 31 uh, July local hospital, uh, when her ex-husband overheard her and came in and, according to her, said, is that how you poisoned them? And she panicked and took the uh, dehydrator down to the tip, something she told police she had done months earlier. So that's where we are, Jack. Uh, quite a few questions uh, that remain to be answered. On my reading of this, and you tell me in your loyally, uh, loyally opinion, I would think a murder or, or, or three murder charges would be most unlikely. Um, yeah, it's, it can be very difficult to um, <laughs> to take these sort of cases from um, suspicion to actual prosecution. Yeah. I think so. More to be told there, Jack. More to be told there. We'll, we'll uh, report on it as information comes through. I've, I've uh, always thought beef wellington's a vastly overrated dish. So. <laughs> it, I'd say the beef wellington is your your male chef whip up who's got absolutely no how, no idea how to cook. And, mm. and, 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 they, and they often taste like it. <laughs> they do, don't they? I, uh, my wife is completely allergic to all fungi, and uh, so we uh, we don't basically get into that um, get into that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's generally prepared by the uh, the male of the house who wants to show how good a cookie is and fails utterly in doing so. Yeah, um, it, it, it comes with a requirement for a round of applause before you tuck in. <laughs> I know. It's really just a pie with a slab of beef and, and a layer yeah. of mushrooms on it, you know. Um, uh, the Gordon Ramsay, uh, the Gordon Ramsay re- recipe is worth following if you want to if you want to do all of that, Jack. Um, all right, the presidential election in the United States. Well, here we are. We're only fifteen months away. Um, we got a couple of teetotalers uh, yeah, as the, the, the favourites. This was uh, the great David Burge from Austin, Texas, uh, always has something amusing to say, and he said, am I the only person in the Republic to have to have noticed that the two prohibitive favourites for the 2024 presidential ballot are both elderly narcissist morons who blast out ludicrously Ooh. blatant lies daily and can't even blame alcohol for them? Um, yeah. He says, never have a pair of teetotalers done such an incredible job of promoting the benefits of a daily r- diet rich in alcohol. Well, there you go. Um, meanwhile, Jack, yeah, look, this point to be made there. <laughs> My father always said, never trust teetotalers. Uh, it's a different time now, Jack, and, uh, and we uh, probably should be uh, giving teetotalers uh, I barely ever drink these days, so I'm almost one of them. Um, <clears throat> um, anyway, at, le- at least you at least you know which end of a bottle to open. Yeah, and we do know that uh, people who are on the booze can. Uh, it's it's not so acceptable these days. It used to be. Uh, yeah, I know I said those things, but I'd had a few drinks, and everyone go, oh, yeah, okay. But now, if you're sort of doing that, you you know you're sort of laying yourself bare to be uh, accused of being an alcoholic or. Uh, you know, one of the, you know those you know the, the, these days you know the, the not the drinking is is frowned upon, but the ability the, the capacity to lead into drunkenness uh, is a bad is considered a very bad thing. Um, uh, meanwhile, we've got a special counsel now, Jack. Well, it, the special counsel was appointed by Trump 
Jack or was appointed by Barr back in the Trump days when when Trump was president. Uh, no, and- this, no, no, the, no, this fellow was a was appointed as a, a district di- district attorney back in those days. He's now been appointed as a special counsel. Yeah, and. That seems pretty fair, doesn't it? I mean, as he's looking into Hunter Biden, we need to go on with that. But but that seems pretty fair, doesn't it? And here's a pro-Trump guy who's going to investigate Hunter Biden. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? Um, it it's uh, it's a, a little bit of a bending of the rules in this sense that the if you if you appoint a special counsel, they're supposed to come from outside the government, and this fellow doesn't. But that's not a um, a, a hugely important factor. Um, it's just a a situation that I think they thought. They had under control that fell apart as soon as the um, uh, the judge started looking at the plea deal, the plea bargain. Um, so now they're scrambling around to find a way to get it back under control. Yeah, I, I saw Hunter Biden's attorney interviewed on, on, uh, about this yesterday, and and he said, "Look, everyone's saying that a plea deal is off the table. We believe it's still on the table, and the prosecutors wanted it. They're the ones who approached us, if you believe." if you believe him on that. Um, but for me, it just seems like someone who's clearly a, a Trump appointee, we don't say pro-Trump, I did before, but uh, it is, a, is a Trump appointee is now looking into Hunter Biden. And overtly, at face value, that seems to be uh, exactly what Trump and Trump and others are whining about when, uh, when in, in terms of uh, Merrick Garland's appointment, a special counsel looking into Trump's behaviour. Yeah, um, the, the, the difficulty that they're trying to fix is that the Department of Justice is not independent, not designed to be and never was. Um, and you, when you have a, a part of the executive that's under the control of the president investigating uh, someone from the president's own family and someone and a political opponent, um, it's very hard thing to sell to the, to, to the great majority of people that what's happening is okay. Well, meanwhile, Jack, in Fulton County, Georgia, uh, as we record this on the 15th of August, uh, uh, a further indictment may occur for Trump, that is, as soon as today. Uh, the grand jury is still sitting and taking evidence. The court closes at five, um, but according to a tweet uh, from, from a journalist uh, who was told that Judge McBurney has indicated that he will keep his courtroom open until the DA's office tells him to close up. And there's some reporting, and we've talked about this, Jack, that uh, that Trump may be indicted under RICO, under 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 Georgia's RICO Act, uh, Racketeering and Influence Corrupt Organisations Act that they have, where there are a number of predicate offences, um, even broader than the federal RICO laws that include perjury, that include um, uh, computer crimes and fraud. And in a RICO prosecution, you have to basically prove that there is an organisation. And if you prove that two of these, in in the case of Georgia, two of these predicate offences have been committed in the space of four years, then you can prosecute the leader of that organisation, which would be Donald Trump. Something to keep an eye on. Um, I, I, I'm told that, uh, well, it's been reported uh, that um, uh, that uh, the Fulton County DA employed a, a, a lawyer who was a RICO expert and that person continues to provide advice yeah, to, I, I, the, to, the Georgia, uh, to the Fulton County uh, DA. The broader, the broader picture, I think that um, the vast majority of the American public have little faith in any of the investigations or prosecutions that are taking place, and um, uh, and it's dealt Trump right back into the presidential election. Well, it, it, it may well have, but that's not the point. I mean, the, the point is you you can't have these things um, uh, you can't have these things being ignored. I mean, what what he pulled as a stunt. On uh, <clears throat> or there, immediately thereafter, um, immediately after the, the the 2020 election, really needs to be jumped on. This is the sort of thing that the American people need to see. 
in in a public courtroom. And let me just remind you, Jack, um, a woman by the name of Pamela Moses in Memphis, Tennessee, um, from Black, she was a Black Lives Matter activist. She was facing her own election-related criminal charges. A few years previously, uh, uh, <coughs> she permanently lost the right to vote after committing a, fe- a felony, but no one had actually removed Moses from the voter rolls or told her she couldn't vote. And in 2019, when state officials began looking into her eligibility, a probation officer signed a certificate saying Moses had completed her sentence and was eligible to vote. So she applied to do so. Even though the corrections officials conceded they made an error, Moses was indicted anyway. She was convicted by a jury in November 2022. And in late January, she was sentenced to six years and one day in prison. For electoral fraud. Crystal Mason, a Texas woman, was sentenced to five years in prison for voting while on federal supervised release, similar to probation in 2016. Probation officials testified that they never told Mason she couldn't vote and her ballot was never counted, but a judge found her guilty of illegally voting anyway. Five years in jail. An appeal is currently pending at Texas' highest criminal courts. There's two similarities about those two cases, Jack. They're both black, but both black women. Uh, there have been other cases. There was a fellow who voted for Trump, who uh, voted for his debt, voted on behalf, or sought a mail-in poll, and 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 made the and and filled it out, voting for Trump in Pennsylvania. He was uh, not. He he was fined, but uh, no conviction was recorded. So there's a real, dif- the real difference there. That's the first thing. But obviously, a lot of people have gone to jail, including those people on January 20, who thought they were doing Trump's bidding and we better get in there and stop. A lot of them have received long, long jail terms, even those who weren't part of, shall we say, these sort of militia-type groups. But those who felt that Trump was telling them the truth and went along entered into, entered into the Congress illegally and ended up just for that act of trespass ended up in jail. I find, I find it very difficult to, to understand why anybody would say, well, Trump gets away with all of this. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a political choice to make as to whether you uh, pursue these charges. Um, and the political choice is going to be, do you want to deal him back into the White House? Well, that's the thing. And that's what, that's what I think, you know, Mary Garland was very, very reluctant. So a special counsel was, was appointed Really, only after the sort of almost the last gasp of the uh, of the select committee, and it was like we're going to have to deal with this. It, it, it was it, it, it seems to me there was a reluctance to do anything about it um, from the from the attorney general's department from the DOJ, but now they have to, and there's no going back. And you're right, you know they might indict him all the way to the the White House. Um, I don't think they have to. Um, uh, I think that's a choice that, that they've made to do. Um, well, and, on, the, on the basis of the con- of the select committee's recommendations, Jack, I can't see how they could avoid it. Uh, yes, they could. <sighs> I mean, the select committee recommended charges be laid, criminal charges be laid. Yeah, but I don't care. Um, it's, it's absolutely a political choice whether you do it or you don't. Well, lots of people have gone to jail for lesser offences, Jack. Yep. And anyway, we'll see about the RICO charges it, for uh, for Trump. Just like I think James Coney made the right decision not to prosecute Hillary Clinton um, uh, for the Well, for hang the, on. The I mean, he, he made that decision after deliberating forever. Yes. And then, then he made that decision a week out of the election. You yeah. can't tell me that didn't influence or affect the result. Yeah, I, I, I don't agree with how he went about it, but in the end, the decision was correct not to prosecute her. Um, that's always a political decision. He made it, um, and I think that the, the, that the current government has got this wrong. They will probably deal Donald Trump back into the White House. Oh, I think that's a big step. I mean, it's a possibility, but it's not a probability. Um, uh, you have to think that uh, that this thing comes crashing down at some point. Um, and it may well come crashing down with his first indictment. Uh, and he was asked during the week whether he's going to, uh, <laughs> by a very rude journalist, if he's going to seek a plea deal, which is very, very funny. I don't know if you saw it. <laughs> what do you call him? That's a wise guy question. That's a wise guy question. It would have to be in Trump's mind, particularly if he's got Rico, if he's got Rico problems, because uh, that, that comes with 25 years after. Mm. All righty. Iowa State Fair, Jack, they were all there. 
some uh, made more noise than others. Now, this is the Republican primary collection of, I don't think Chris Christie was there. Trump called him a fat pig. Lovely. And um, I don't think Chris was there, but I think the rest of them were. Yeah, and not going well. Um, it looks like Trump territory to me. Yeah, I, I, well, you would think so, Jack. Um, and, and, and we just get a further reminder that Ron DeSantis cannot reinvent himself quickly enough to be a sort of a national uh, option or, or it would be an option across the United States as a Republican candidate for the presidency. No. He's getting overwhelmed. I mean, when he's talking about the indictments, he must be going, oh, God, not another one. Because I just can't get in the air here. All right. Uh, and, of course, in the meantime, uh, Joe has uh, locked in Kamala Harris as his, uh, as his running mate, Jack. Yeah, he, he tweeted on – it was it was actually um, uh, three years to the day uh, since he'd picked her as his vice presidential running mate, and he says, picking her was one of the best decisions I made as a presidential nominee. Uh, since that day, she's demonstrated that she was the perfect choice. So it looks like um, Kamala is locked in for the job. Locked in. And do you reckon he, he actually typed that tweet out himself, mate? Um, no, but um, one presumes they checked with him before they posted it. Yeah. All right. Uh, very quickly, Jack, United, King, United Kingdom politics, UK politics. Uh, Dom Cummings has come out with a bit of goss on uh, the Prime Minister, Rishi, Sen- Rishi Sunak. Well, we believe this is from Dom, Dom Cummings, but it comes from uh, All right. um, a, a friend who's a um, – but I understand it's from Dom Cummings in any, in any event. Um, uh, he descri- And the description of – Rishi Sunak's office, um, uh, it, it, it reminded me of Kevin Rudd, to be quite honest. Um, the PM's office is a massive bottleneck, can't sustain focus when the news shifts, can't build a team or lead, etc. cetera. Um, uh, you go to a meeting and uh, he's read all these briefs and he's over all these, and each meeting improves a second order issue, but the big issue never gets addressed. And that sounds awfully like Kevin Rudd. Indeed. Meanwhile, Jack, uh, are they decriminalising burglary in the UK? Well, effectively they are. Um, almost none of the neighbourhoods in the UK have solved a burglary in the last 12 months. Well, have there been any? Oh, yeah, there we go. 30 to 48.2%. No break-ins had been solved. In, in three, three years, years, ending March 2023. From 30,100 neighbourhoods. We're not suggesting that all 30,100 neighbourhoods, how they count that, um, but uh, have, 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 have had homes. Well, I suppose some of them would have had homes, but not all of those 30,100 30, neighbourhoods had, uh, had, uh, had, had, had suffered burglaries. Um, but um, no break-ins have been... Uh, solved, or I guess pre- presume uh, brought before the courts. Very strange, Jack. It, it, it's on not, caper, it's not, mate. It's Screwdriver not in the pocket, and off you go. It's not that dissimilar in Australia. That, um, the last time I was burgled in in Sydney was back in Potts Point day, so it's quite a while ago. Basically, the attitude of the police was: look, uh, he, uh, um, here's the number you can call up on the central case. Yeah. I'll get, I'll give you a um, uh, a report number so you, you can go to your insurer. Yeah. You get a reference number and that's it. That's what I found when I had my car broken into in Redfern. Um, going back a few years, um, uh, I got my house in uh, Northcote uh, um, uh, uh, burgled uh, twice uh, when I wasn't home. If, it was, if I was home, it would have been aggravated. Uh, and uh, the police were terrific. You know, they fingerprinted me. They fingerprinted <laughs> And it turned out that around the corner there was a drug dealer who was taking – Goods uh, in lieu of cash, uh, and uh, and they raided the whole lot about six months later. Excellent work, because burglaries are not crimes committed on their own, Jack. They will, they will be part of a broader, yeah. broader, broader uh, group of crimes, generally around drug dealing and so forth. So they're worth cracking because um, you you get the, you know you you get the you know the the additional prosecutions for other matters other more serious matters often yeah but they seem to have given up uh, the most annoying thing about um, uh, a home burglary is, is you know if they if they take the teller you go down to Bunnings and buy you know oh, it may help and buy on the new ones. Yeah. Um, but it, it's when they take you know something that's 
sort of precious family uh, um, heirloom yeah. or something that, uh, or they or they or, or, or in or in doing so they trash your house that's that was the worst thing for me they just when you just get home and they just completely trash the place I've heard of people who mm. you know have who was the um, smeared on their walls uh, who was and the that journalist sort of stuff, in Melbourne know? who um, <laughs> the journal- journalist in Melbourne who voluntarily shared her spare bedroom with um, uh, another fellow from the comedy circuit and he pinched her mother's her late mother's jewelry and sold it that's where it gets annoying oh i think i know who that is but we won't name him at the moment jack uh, he had a significant drug problem at the time i think you'll find meanwhile jack in argentina uh it's almost like none of the above isn't it it is. Um, uh, um, it's it's, it's a two st- another one of these two stage elections. I think October twenty two, um, uh, the um, the real election takes place. This is a sort of a practice match. Yeah. So uh, look, uh, the two main political forces, left and right, uh, were punished. Uh, uh, and uh, now we have a sort of. This is what happens when. This is what happens when when your two major parties parties fail. There's lessons to be learned here everywhere. It's a basic in in, in political science that when your two major parties fail, all of a sudden the fringe becomes acceptable uh, and supportable. And this is what's happened in Argentina, where you've got a rock singing libertarian candidate who's first place in a huge shakeup. And so we've got an election coming in October, and with sixty five percent of the of the of ballots counted so far, the far right libertarian economist Javier Millet had thirty two point two percent of the vote. And I suggest that would be a very, very bad thing for Argentina if he was elected. But that's what happens when um, uh, to major parties lose the confidence of, yeah. of voters. Um, Argentina is also a, um, a, a constant reminder of the importance of stable government and a decent constitution. Um, at the turn of the last century, when uh, Australia, were, at the time of federation, Argentina and Australia were almost equivalent on everything. Um, mm. And they have um, done very, very much worse than we have since then. And that's due to basically failed political leadership. You've got bad country- constitution, um, no rule of law, uh, all the things that the Brits oh, left and, us. And emerging, and emerging out of a military junta. That's the, that's probably the big difference. Uh, well, they um, went into a military junta after. The, the, the but yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, no, that's right. But 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 I mean, yeah, through that process, you know, you know, thousands disappeared. It was a, it was a fascist regime. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they've emerged out of that. I would su- I'd suggest that you know that sort of occurrence politically in any country will take decades to to overcome. Uh, we do have a reader's letter, Jack, from one of our favourite listeners and one of our most devoted listeners, Lawrence. We know Lawrence, Farmer Lawrence. Um, he had a couple of points to make. Uh, the first is that Bobby around Bobby Jr. and he and I had a little bit of a back and forth on this in, in, on Twitter. Um, he believes that. That, that Bobby Jr., that is Bobby Kennedy Jr., may um, have a fairly strong influence on the result next year if he if he runs as a mail-in candidate. Is that very likely, Jack? Um, I think it's unlikely that he will run as a mail-in candidate. He seems to have a lot of support from the right. So, and my response to Lawrence was, I, you know, Democrat voters aren't going to be drawn towards him. Um, uh, 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 it's more likely that he could split the Republican vote, but uh, that's um, that's just, that's just my opinion. And Lawrence believes that that he might actually take votes from both camps, and that's quite possible. Yeah, it is possible. Seems to have a lot of money behind him, Jack, and it's not just Kennedy money because they don't have that much these days. It's uh, a lot of money from, shall we say, the fringe right wing. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so we'll see how that goes if he's going to run as a sort of uh, none of the above type uh, type candidate. He's got a fair bit of history. I think that's the thing that'll probably probably kill him, particularly in that anti-vax space. And he also uh, that's Lawrence. It is Lawrence. That is he also had a bit of a crack at you, Jack, with your glib comment comparing Putin's persecution of Navalny, which I thought was a bit off. Myself, Sorry, I miss I miss that comparing Putin. I uh, compare you're comparing Putin's persecution of Navalny with Trump's multiple indictments in oh, the okay. US. 
that was a bit glib, and um, and we don't really we don't really should put that. Navalny's been jailed three times. He's been poisoned once. He's had green dice sprayed in his face. He's probably been tortured as we speak. Uh, absolutely no comparison there with the Donald. Now moving on to sport, Jack. It's been a huge week in sport. Um, but let's kick it off with the biggest ticket in town, and that is the Matildas, who play uh, England on Wednesday night. God only knows how big that television audience is going to be. Um, but uh, it was 3.69 million viewers. Uh, that's in the capitals alone um, on Saturday night. Um, huge, huge audience um, and... Uh, and likely to get bigger. There's, every now and then you you watch a sporting event uh, in Australia and, and sort of come to the view that the whole country's watching, and it was one of those moments. It was. Um, I noticed uh, uh, even at the AFL games, there's a, um, a lovely little video of the players in the Brisbane rooms post the game um, watching the penalty shootout, still in their kit. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I think they might have even... Um, uh, forgotten about the team song so they could watch the penalty shootout. Yeah, lovely. And similar similar scenes at the MCG. George Hewitt, the Carlton uh, utility midfielder, uh, was interviewed after the game. He played a hell of a game, was best on ground, and um, and he was asked what whether he knew what was going on. He said, well, we heard seven cheers, so we figured they'd won seven times. And that, of course, was the penalty shootout. Every, every goal that was kicked, uh, had a resounding cheer from around the MCG, which is kind of lovely too. Seven Channel Seven paid four million dollars for the rights. They must be <laughs> rubbing their hands together, but they've only paid for the Australian games and the semis and the final, I believe, uh, having having bought the rights from Optus, who have the rights for for the entire tournament. So they are. They are going. Uh, they would be very, very pleased with themselves. Uh, biggest television audience um, uh, since the Sydney Olympics, Jack. I think the um, uh, the advertising rates for Wednesday night and potentially Sunday night they might be being revised as we speak. Um, yeah, and uh, you don't think you know Joe Smash Repairs are going to get a Guernsey? It's going to be the big corporates. Um, I guess the question is, Jack. Um, the Matildas are into a semi. How does Football Australia drag the huge following into greater participation numbers among children and adults and girls and boys? Uh, well, their um, particip- particip- participation numbers amongst children are pretty good. They are. In fact, it is the highest level of participation in any football code in the country. But then they hit 18, 19, and it just drops off. Mm. Well, they certainly have a problem with the A-League that they've tried to fix on a number of occasions of getting rid of the ethnic tribalism out of the clubs. But has it returned, Jack? I mean, in some form? Is the A-League a bit of a drag on the game, given some of the, you know, sort of tribal behaviours of some some of the club's followers? You know, we're talking about uh, Melbourne, we're talking about Western Sydney. You know, you wouldn't take your kids to some of these games. No, you certainly wouldn't. Um, uh, and um, the AFL, indeed, the Sydney Swans really led the way to, to, to a solution to this you know, 20 years ago when they said, look, we want to have 50% women members. Yeah. We want, yeah. The, mo- we want the mothers and daughters um, uh, going along and as well. And it's just, not just saying that and as something that's desirable. They actually but went they out, went and, out and, did and did it. They went out and did it, yes. Yeah, yeah, they went out and did it. And this is where a lot of friends of mine – Women who are, who are associated with the Sydney Swans Footy Club, that's when they started coming in and really embracing the club. And you see it. You, you actually see it in their, in their members' lists and, you know, that, that there's this broad group of people who just they'll go virtually every week. Yep. Uh, every week they play at the SCG. Took a, took a fair bit of work um, uh, and, you know, have to have to spend a dollar to do it, but it made a huge amount of difference. And the, the other clubs have embraced this as well. Now they were just the leaders. That's all. But uh. my uh, dear friend Meredith Bergman was a foundation member, and um, yeah, look, she uh, I think she's got the little Sydney Swans tag that says, you know, you can go wherever you like, and the, <laughs> the SCG because you know she was one of those ones who again brought women in to support the club. But there's more about soccer than than this. Um, um, uh, or football, we should say, appropriately. Um, 
it would seem to me to be an incredible shame that the game um, has this huge high, particularly among women and girls, uh, and and then it just peters away to nothing. And it really needs some sort of sort of backup. Um, but we'll get to that in a little while. Should it be a public holiday? Uh, not so yeah, sure. That's about if, the that's if Australia wins the final on Sunday. Yeah, a couple, I'm, I'm, couple yeah. of big ifs there. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. I, I don't, don't have a strong view about it one well, way or the other. Well, you come from Hong Kong, Jack. You have a public holiday every every Wednesday. Yeah, and we love them, and we love them. But um, one thing I would say about the, the Matildas thing is not to get too carried away with the huge numbers and the great interest. Um, um, you know, <laughs> you go back to winning the America's Cup, what was that, 1983? Um, uh, and it, it didn't make yachting our national sport. Um, uh, oh, well, that's that's a whole host of reasons there, I mean, it's a but rich man's sport. But it had huge interest. Uh, uh, that's the last time I all can you remember need, that. All you need to play footy is is a ball, mate. Yeah. Uh, a ball and a bit of get up and go. So, I mean, look, they, they really do need to win. Peter, but we'll get back to the public holiday thing for a minute. Peter Dutton says it will cost the Australian economy $2 billion. Where, where do you reckon he got that figure from, Jack? Uh, no idea. <laughs> I reckon he's, he's divided Australia's GDP by 365 and come up with it. Yeah, he could have. Um, he has uh, instead, he said that uh, that the opposition will provide a $250 million uh, sport, sports grant um, uh, for, uh, uh, for the promotion of, I mean, I guess, a sport across the board. Uh, into the in, 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 into the communities, into Australian communities, and I just thought, gee, we've heard that before, haven't we? Wasn't there wasn't there a hundred million dollar community sports program that the coalition had in back in twenty nineteen? Yeah. I mean, it was a slush fund, and that that ultimately rejected um, grant applications for clubs that needed changing room facilities for girls and women. Uh, but they didn't get it because they weren't in marginal seats. I mean, yeah, um, uh, I, I don't know of a sports fund of that kind that hasn't been a slush fund. There was it, um, uh, um, Ro, uh, Ros Kelly, um, uh, who got, yeah, well, got, like, got punted from a Labor ministry, um, uh, the former wife of Paul Kelly, the journalist, um, for the whiteboard. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and... Um, uh, look, yes, uh, we're not going to forget the uh, sports rorts in a hurry there, Peter, so you can perhaps uh, tell, you can sing from another song sheet there. Uh, look, a public holiday or not, people can take the day off if they want to. I, I'm not really assured of this. I, I, I think it's a lot of nonsense, and all the state premiers have fallen for it. Um, Dan Andrews says, oh, I'm not going to comment on this in case I jinx them. Um, and it's all, all a bit of nonsense, but really what we want to see, not through some sports rorts program, but really what we want to see is some development money put into the game. So uh, this support, this you know, extraordinary support for the Matildas manifests itself into participation at junior and adult levels, Jack. Meanwhile, Jack, uh, in the AFL, there's a battle for the eight. It's uh, going on every week. Basically, won't be resolved for another couple. Two more, two more rounds until uh, until uh, the home and away season has concluded. There are still thirteen teams in the mix to make the eight. Now, your mob, the Swans, the Tipsters are saying the Swans can't make it with games against Crows, with against the Crows in Adelaide. And then Melbourne at the SCG. I, I reckon they're good for one win there. They're going beautifully. Tough, yeah, tough, yeah. tough to beat Adelaide at Adelaide, and Melbourne are a good side. But I reckon you know that's probably where they can pick that win up and get in the finals. Uh, Collingwood play Brisbane uh, on Friday night at Marvel. That'll be a big test for both sides. The Lions tend not to go all that well at Marvel, so you back uh, Collingwood in. Uh, and the Blues, Jack, eight in a row now, and they're paying $6 to win the flag, which I think is terrible, terrible odds. A bit skinny. Uh, fourth line of betting uh, with with Brisbane, so they're sort of equal fives, fives to one. Collingwood are favourites, uh, five to two. Melbourne are fours. Uh, Port Adelaide, nine to two. Uh, the Swannies are 40 to one, Jack, if you want to have a little dabble there, and Geelong are at 20s. Yeah, I, I don't um, think the Swans are a serious chance. 
Um, uh, uh, I, 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 think, I think there's every chance they've all been written off to make the finals, and I find that a bit hard. I think they've yeah. only got to win one to squeeze in. Yeah, probably right. Um, uh, Carlton's certainly pl- playing better than anybody else, but you've got to win from fourth. That's tricky. So, you know, I think the well, 61 the Michigan. Are- there is a sort of benefit. You, 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 so let's say they finish fifth, and that's that's not determined. They, they've got two pretty hard games to play. But if they finish fifth, they play eighth. They play at the, they play their first final of the G. Then they go into the semi stage to, to uh, if they win that one to to, to fight the loser of uh, either Collingwood, Brisbane, Melbourne, Port Adelaide, and that will be the hard one. I think the worst road trip for any side in the finals will be Brisbane at the Gabba. That's they, well, they haven't lost there this year. I think Port Adelaide have been beaten at, at Adelaide, but um, but uh, Brisbane, if you if you get that trip, it's going to be a hard win. And if you win that one, you probably go all right. You might even go very very deep into September. Uh, in cricket, Jack Mitch Marsh to skipper Australia against South Australia. Sorry, South Africa, I should say. I've looked and I've abbreviated it as SA. Um, to skip Australia against South Africa in the three T20s. Um, that's uh, the first of which starts um, starts uh, the last day of this month, Jack. That's a big, big tick for this bloke. He's often been he's often been um, uh, criticised by punters. He's acknowledged that um, himself. Um, he is an extraordinary cricketer. And a wonderful bat to watch. I think it's great credit to him. Uh, Cummins remains captain of the ODI squad despite his injury uh, because there uh, there are five ODIs in South Africa and three T20s. Uh, Cummins uh, at this stage has said he will be fit to play. And everyone's getting ready, of course, for the... uh, for the ODI World Cup in India in October uh, and November, Jack. Terrific for Mitch. Love him. One of the sensible things that England cricket have done is to split the white ball and red ball um, uh, captaincy and and the um, a fair bit of the team as well. I think that's been... Oh, well, they've really had that impressed upon them by Stokes retiring from it. You know, mm-hmm. Stokes only plays test cricket now. Um, so it, it sort of comes that way. It, it, I, I, I tend to agree that it puts a lot on a skipper, certainly mm. if he's doing all three, and Cummins was for a while. Um, uh, and, um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's horses for courses. And I think Mitch Marsh would be a terrific captain of the, uh, the T20 side. Yeah. All and right. We, just before we leave sport, um, we were talking last week about um, – Country and and suburban footy clubs. There's a little club called Biragura just out of Geelong. I think they play in the Colacan District uh, Football League. That'd be tough. Uh, and call. they've got a new recruit. I think he's about 35 or 36. Right. Grant, Grant Nell. Um, uh, and the diver. Might, the diver. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I think he went to the Rio Olympics and won a medal at the Commonwealth Games. Yeah. But when we when we still had a Commonwealth Games. Yeah. Um, um, at 35, he played his first game in the twos uh, at the opening round of the season for Biragura. Yeah, how did he get on? And he's finally, finally cracked it for the seniors and, uh, and and kicked a goal with his first kick in the seniors and promptly did a backflip. Oh, fans, that's probably been pretty good at those, Jack. I also thought if you you be one of those blokes, you just yell, "You can't touch him," because he'll just dive. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, mate. Take us out. Take us out with something silly. Uh, have you been uh, following the return of Annabelle C- Crab's show? What's it called? Um, uh, uh, the Kitchen Show. Kitchen Cabinet, yeah. Kitchen Cabinet. Um, uh, I don't know whether you've been following this on Twitter, but there has been some head explosions on Twitter. Well, I've um, seen this. It's been a bit ugly, isn't it? Annabelle uh, Crab, by the way, folks, is a lovely human being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, they call her Madonna Flam, which I think is a, a, a joke that um, uh, that Sean McKay left it on her show when she first did Kitchen Cabinet. Um, uh, and and they're concerned that she doesn't give um, uh, coalition people a hard enough time on this show. Yeah, that's the argument. When it's yeah. not that whether you're moral, show. cruel, racist, and corrupt, a sugar coated for audience consumption was mm. the sort of general tone of these things. 
Um, these people are nuts. This is supposed to be a public broadcast. <laughs> We're not supposed to be so partisan. The ABC is not supposed to be so partisan that they can't um, uh, 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 talk a, a fish curry with uh, with Scott Morrison. You know? Well, look, I um, the, the 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 funniest one of the kitchen cabinet shows, I, I, I should go back and watch it. It was hilarious. They had Joe Hockey on and Joe had the, had the house in Canberra and he's, of course he's for the food. He's just, he said one of his staff is down to pick up the mixed barbecue set from the supermarket with yeah. four, four snacks, a couple of burgers and, and some cheap steak. And the sort of thing, the you, sort of thing you win at the pub on Friday night. Yeah. It, 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 well, packaged up for, for, for the barbecue for those again, who don't, aren't very good at catering. And, but the funniest thing about it, well, there were two funny things. He, he, he walks um, Annabelle Crab around to his, Room and he had a single bed. I mean, this person goes the treasurer at the time had a single bed with a Bart Simpson Duna cover, Jack. Oh, that's great. <laughs> And then the then then he had a good laugh himself, and he was telling a story because Brendan Nelson would stay when Nelson was uh, defence minister, would stay in the garage, a converted right. garage. Yes. And um, he said it was obviously not a great conversion because it, it, there were problems with the electricity. He said you can have the heating on or the lights, but not both. And so uh, he talked about with a laugh, and it is kind of funny, with, with senior military officials <laughs> tapping on the door of this converted garage at 3 o'clock in the morning telling Brendan about some sort of crisis and they can have the heater on or the lights, but not both. Yeah. Very funny. So that sort of stuff. I mean, I don't care whether it's sort of humanising politicians or not. Yeah, there's actually some really funny anecdotal stuff there. I mean, how else would we know Joe Hockey sleeps under a Bart Simpson Duna cover? Yeah, well, I haven't seen the show for years, of course, but um, uh, but she she is very good, and uh, I just think some of these people need to take a pill. Yeah. Yeah, need to take a little bit of a break from Twitter. So, I'm, all right, mate, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts today. We just want to remind our listeners uh, that uh, uh, our, our, our we are open to your comments, suggestions, criticisms, etc. and you can contact me on Twitter. I am paying a bit more attention to my DMs. I sort of lost my way a bit there. So you can hit me up on Twitter on at Jack the Insider. I always check my DMs while I'm, don't spend that much time on Twitter these days. Um, so I'll be doing that. And, uh, Jack, uh, you can get hold of Jack by hitting him up on his Substack. Uh, give us yeah. the address there, please, Jack. Hongkongjack.substack.com. There you go. And uh, we look forward to all your comments, and uh, we'll publish those that are publishable, broadcastable, um, uh, when, 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 when they arrive in, in our inboxes, apologies to basement. I think we've given him the flick a couple of times, but that's only, it's, an, it's a, simply an organizational thing, basement. We'll get to you. Drop me a line during the week and we'll get to you. All right. Thanks very much, listeners. And we'll see you out and we'll see you next week. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>